Welcome everyone to Tea Time with Lee and Lowe Books. I'm Louise May, editor at large at Lee and Lowe Books. I'm here today with author illustrator Christy Hale. We've worked on several books together and today we're going to talk about our latest project, the bilingual book, Todos Igualis, Un Credo de Lemon Grove, All Equal, A Ballad of Lemon Grove. The book was published last fall. And just before we get started, I want to mention that we both have backgrounds that are illustrations from the book. Uh, Christie's is the title page and mine is the copyright dedication page, which is an overview of the village of Lemon Grove. So I am going to now do show you the cover of the book. So Christy, could you tell us briefly what the story is about? This book explores the 1931 Lemon Grove case, which was the first successful school desegregation case in United States history. Uh, this was 16 years before Mendez versus Westminster, which was a case that ruled that separate schools for children of Mexican descent were unconstitutional, and 23 years before Brown versus Board of Ed, that declared that school desegregation was unconstitutional throughout the country. Roberto Alvarez and 74 other Mexican-American children attended the Lemon Grove School, where all 169 students studied together as equals. In the summer of 1930, the Lemon Grove School Board made a plan to segregate the Mexican-American children in a small inferior school. On January 5th, 1931, those students were blocked from entering their regular school. The Mexican American community refused to allow this segregation and they organized. They filed a lawsuit against the school board with 12 year old Roberto Alvarez as the plaintiff. On March 12th, 1931, the judge announced his ruling supporting the children's right to equal education. The Mexican-American students were immediately reinstated in the Lemon Grove School to learn as equals once again. So uh, the Lemon Grove case was an historical first in many ways, but it's uh, pretty much unknown to most people. Where did you get the idea? Uh, what inspired you with, uh, to write this story? In 2013, I was teaching art and graphic design at Palo Alto High School. And I first learned about the case uh, at an in-service workshop. And I wondered why I'd never heard of it before. So I went home that night and I started researching. And the more that I learned, the more that I was inspired by the power of the Mexican American community coming together and using the legal system to fight for the right of equal education. And so I felt that their example would give hope to many. And from that first day, I envisioned a picture book. So the, the subtitle of the book is Un Corrido de Lemon Grove. What is a corrido and why did you use it to frame the story? A corrido is a song that tells a story. Corridos are simple songs passed between people to spread news. I grew up playing the guitar and singing along with John Baez and Bob Dylan ballads. So this kind of storytelling resonated for me. Traditionally, corridos were about real people, events, and heroes who fight against injustice. The Mexican-American families of Lemon Grove were definitely heroes, and I felt like this was a way to share that information. Well, as you can see on, on this uh, slide that we're showing, um, the ballad with all the lyrics in both English and Spanish. Um, I understand, Christy, that you have a recording of the first two verses of the Spanish Version. Actually, the first, the first one verse. Oh, the first verse. Okay. Um, Here we go. Could you play it? Yeah. Okay. Great, that's terrific. So uh, now Christy and I would like to read the first two spreads of the story to you. Uh, since this is a bilingual book, Christy will read first in Spanish and then I will read the English. 
todas las mañanas, de lunes a viernes, mientras el sol salía lentamente sobre Lemon Grove, California, Roberto Álvarez, de 12 años, salía corriendo por la puerta de su casa. Le encantaba ir a la escuela y no quería llegar tarde. Corría por la avenida del norte y doblaba en la esquina para llegar en la calle Olivo, donde se juntaba con sus amigos rumbo a la escuela al otro lado del pueblo. Weekday mornings, while the sun was slowly ripening over Lemon Grove, California, 12-year-old Roberto Alvarez raced out the door. He loved school and didn't want to be late. He hurried along North Avenue and around the corner to Olive Street where he joined his friends on their way across town. Roberto, junto con 74 niños de su barrio, hacían este viaje diario a la escuela. Sus padres, que habían emigrado de México y se habían establecido en Lemon Grove, ya se habían ido a trabajar en los huertos, los campos, la empacadora y la cantera del lugar. Los niños más grandes tomaban de la mano a las chiquitos para cruzar la peligrosa intersección de la Avenida Imperial. Juntos cruzaban las vías del ferrocarril y se dirigían hacia la calle Lincoln. Los hermanos, primos y amigos se cuidaban unos a otros. Roberto and 74 other children from the neighborhood continued on their daily trip. Their parents Migrants from Mexico who had settled together in Lemon Grove years before were already at work in the orchards, fields, packing house, and quarry. The older children guided the younger ones through the busy Imperial Avenue intersection, over the railroad tracks, and onto Lincoln Street. Brothers, sisters, cousins, and friends all took care of one another. And here we would like to show you a photo of the real Roberto Alvarez and the Lemon Grove School. And in the class photo, uh, if you can see where my cursor is, it is that is Roberto in the class photo there. Um, so now we know that this is a story about real people and a real event. What research did you do, um, Christy, to make sure that this story was told correctly, authentically, and um, all the facts were as they should be. So I began my research on the internet. I read, I read an article about the case in the Journal of San Diego History by Roberto Alvarez Jr., the son of the plaintiff. Also online, I watched an hour long docudrama um, on the Lemon Grove incident made in 1986. I ordered two books, Roberto Alvarez Jr.'s book, Familia, in which he further discusses the case, and a book of historic photographs of Lemon Grove, co-authored by Helen O'Field, the president of the Lemon Grove Historical Society. Next, I began a correspondence with Helen from the Historical Society. She answered my questions, and she sent me countless articles and photos. She also gave me contact information for John Valdez, and he was a historian for the Lemon Grove Oral History Project. I emailed John and he suggested that I call him. And then in that phone call, he invited me to come down to Lemon Grove, offering to introduce me to families involved in the Lemon Grove incident. So I spent two days in Lemon Grove. Uh, John was my guide and he introduced me to women now in their 90s who had been blocked out of the school back in 1931. One of these was John's aunt, uh, Marie Luisa Padilla, and the other, Alicia Alice Gomez, daughter of Juan Gonzalez, the community organizer of Los Vecinos, the neighbors. I also met with other families, and uh, they also shared this important history. The Lemon Grove families welcomed me into their homes, and they shared meals with me. I also met with Bob and Lorraine Castellanos, niece and nephew of Ramona, Ramona uh, Castellanos Alvarez, Roberto's mother. And then I spent an additional day doing extensive research at the Lemon Grove Historical Society. I was very fortunate to have the assistance of Roberto Alvarez Jr., the son of the plaintiff in the case. And he was able to carefully review everything I had written to make sure that all was accurate. And he provided me with the use of family photos. So as you look at this on the upper left, 
is Helen Ofield of the Lemon Grove Historical Society, who I believe is with us today. Next to her is Robert, Roberto Alvarez Jr., uh, son of the plaintiff, who was really the first to bring all this case to light. And then continuing along the top, uh, you see Alice or Alicia Gomez and her brother Henry Gomez, and they are both children of Juan Gonzalez, who was the main community organizer. Um, Alice, Alicia was actually blocked out from the school back in 1931. Henry was too young at that point. I'm not even sure if he was born. Down below, um, it, you see Mary Luisa Padilla and um, John Valdez, who was my host. And then to the right is Bob and uh, Lorraine Castellanos. And they, again, are niece and nephew of Ramona um, Castellanos Alvarez, Roberto's mother. It's really great to see the, the real people involved in the story. Um, you don't always have that opportunity. And this was really great that you were able to meet all these people. They were so excited to share their history. They, yeah. they just couldn't say enough. <laughs> yeah. Finally, somebody else would tell, you know, their story would become better known. Right. So uh, the illustrations that in the book are, are unique and they're beautiful. And it's a um, definite uh, uh, significant style. So could you uh, tell us about the style that you used? Okay. You want to click to that page? I will do that. Yes. Okay, the illustrations were inspired by the style of vintage California citrus labels. So prior to the 1960s, produce was shipped in wooden crates and the labels attached to the end of the crates identified the brand, the region, and the kind of produce. And additionally, they had to be colorful and eye-catching so the perishable content would uh, sell to shoppers quickly. So you can see Lemon Grove had some of their own labels and I, incorporated those into the book. Okay, so I think I'm going to take this off now. And here we are back. So um, not all picture books, as we all know, are illustrated by the person who wrote them, but you, Christy, do both. So what are some of the advantages and challenges of being both the author and illustrator of the book? Well, picture books have two kinds of narrative, verbal and visual. Being able to control both storytelling roles allows me to rely on words sometimes and images other times. For instance, I don't have to tell you what Roberto Alvarez looks like, I can show you. However, the challenge for an illustrator, especially in a nonfiction book, is doing visual research for accuracy. I spent extensive time hunting for images of old lemon grove landscapes, buildings, clothing, and of course people. So after the research, all the research that you did and deciding on the illustration style, it was time for us to roll up our sleeves and edit the manuscript. Um, this manuscript took a really long time to edit, I have to say. <laughs> my, my files show that we went through about 15 versions of the manuscript over about two and a half years. And uh, by that time, we felt that the story was final. But all that is in addition to all the time you spent prior to that, uh, developing the idea and doing the research. So let's talk a little bit about the process. Uh, the first thing, you had told me about this project, but then the first thing you actually showed me was just the corrido. Yes, and though you liked the idea of the corrido, you felt that the form was too spare to convey the whole story. And so you encouraged me to write in an accompanying narrative told more from a child's point of view. Right, so the next version that I saw was, had the, the corrido interspersed among the narrative text, but not every, there wasn't in many, there weren't enough verses of the corrido to have a verse on every spread of the book. So uh, where did we go from there? <laughs> Well, it took me a while to let go of the idea of having the corrido set the content for each spread. So honestly, I feel like part of our working dynamic has been you guiding me to a stronger form. So I, I finally let go. <laughs> and then we just placed it elsewhere. <laughs> So finally, what we came up with, and, and uh, oh, Christy's giving me credit, but I think it was really a collaboration, 
uh, we decided to put give the Corito its due as a, a spread in the beginning of the book with the music, with all the lyrics in both Spanish and English, and then after that, tell the story as a narrative story. Um, and then the other thing that we were able to do is we added some additional pages at the back so that we would have a lot of space for supplemental materials. Yeah, we, we uh, love to have a lot of back matter in our nonfiction books. Uh, and uh, I, I think that uh, both readers, parents, teachers, librarians really love to have that extra information so that they can go into a topic more deeply. Uh, so, as you know, this is a bilingual book and uh, you, Christy, were writing in both Spanish and English. So how did you make that work? Well, I started out with the corrido in Spanish and it was important that it was in Spanish because it's a song and the uh, lyrics had to have a rhyme and a constant meter. And actually what was the most challenging for me in the whole process was then adapting the corrido to English and still keeping the meter. Um, you struggled so, with that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So at your advice, I wrote the narrative and the back matter first in English and then later translated it into, English, uh, into Spanish. Uh, yes, and that worked out well, especially since I do not speak Spanish, uh, that uh, we worked on the English narrative. And then when we felt, we both felt that the Spanish and English were final to our way of thinking, we had copy editors review it. And we also went back to uh, the experts that Christy had been in touch with to make sure that they felt that everything was accurate and um, represented their story authentically from their point of view. Uh, so the book, Todos Iguales, All Equal, has been very well received by the media and the general public. It received three-starred reviews. We've gotten a lot of notable and best book designations. But I'm more curious about what kinds of reactions you get from the people when you do presentations about the book. Well. I was very fortunate to launch this book in the Lemon Grove Library. And uh, the Lemon Grove Library is in fact in the very same building as the old school where the students were blocked from entering in 1931. Yeah, so I there was a lot, <laughs> it was, I couldn't have wished for anything better. Um, there was a large crowd in attendance and Helen O'Field, the president of the Historical Society and I, uh, were in discussion and there were many people from the community there and they all engaged in lively discussion, lots of comments and questions. Um, the Lemon Grove people were so proud to share their story on a wider level. And I felt really lucky to witness the strong sense of community that they still enjoy. So when I present to schools, I consistently see by students' questions and responses that they care deeply about equality. And they've been interested to learn about my research process and to see pictures of the real people that were involved in this story. Yeah, it's I, been very think, rich. Yeah, I think kids really uh, find it fascinating when they see the photos and say, oh, this was real people. And I know my husband, he said when he was a little boy, he'd always ask his mother uh, when she would suggest a book, is it real? If he wanted to know that the people uh, or the story was real. And I think uh, kids really relate to seeing the photos of the people in addition to the way they're illustrated in the book. So uh, let me see now. I think I'm going to go to the chat and see if there's any questions that we have here. Um, let's see. Okay, well, everybody has say, is saying that this is an incredibly inspiring story and a piece of history, which they're happy to have us sharing with them. And um, uh, feeling, yes, the same way we do that, it's incredibly moving that you were able to meet with the real people that uh, were actually involved in the case. And and from a teacher, I assume it says, as teachers, we do love all the historical background. <laughs> so um, I think that wraps up pretty much what we have to say to you today. Um, 
I want to mention that on the Lilo website, we have a teacher's guide. Uh, we have a link to Christy's podcast about the book. Uh, Christy has many uh, resources on her site as well. And on both our sites, you can also find the recording of the Cruido that uh, Christy played earlier. And if you want to listen again, sing along, you're certainly welcome to do that. <laughs> Louise, I noticed there's, uh, there's some more uh, things popping up here in the questions. Um, okay. So uh, one of the questions are how big are the illustrations and how were they made? Um, okay. So uh, that's a good question. I, uh, I worked probably a little larger than real uh, actual reproduction size. And I worked, uh, as you can see actually behind me is the title page. And I worked on kind of a craft type of uh, like a cardboard almost. I did uh, painting and printing with gouache, uh, which is an opaque water-based paint. But I wanted to work on this uh, oh, uh, sort of rough uh, craft type look because I wanted it to replicate the idea of being on a wooden crate, you know, being an image that was printed. And, and I did a lot of uh, stencil work when I was creating the illustrations and I rolled with a brayer uh, some water-based printing inks and gouache to, I wanted it to look kind of graphic and evoke the feeling of those old uh, retro labels. Let's yeah, I, I, think, I think both uh, the material you used and the art style definitely gives the book a vintage style, which is appropriate to the time period, the 19, uh, early 1930s when this took place. So another question came in, once you made the illustrations, how did you move it to the digital realm? So oh. there's, there's I, I don't always work consistently when I do books. Like sometimes I deliver my art digitally, like I scan it myself and provide the um, publisher with you know, digital files. In this case, I sent original art to the publisher. They sent it to the printer to have it scanned. And that means the, the printer is breaking it down into the four basic colors that are used for printing, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Um, and so then I received back, I, I'm also the designer of the book, and I received back those files. And then I put those files into the layout and I could do things like add the border edges around things or you know some some ish, some different things like that. <laughs> yeah Christy's a woman of many talents. She writes, she illustrates, she designs. <laughs> She's a one one woman style uh, uh, service. <laughs> Except I uh, I want to say see. I want to say again that that this was an incredibly collaborative experience. And it may seem like I've done these things, but for instance, I had help from my friend, uh, Elizabeth Gomez. We uh, sang lots of corridos together and her husband ended up writing the tune for this corrido. Um, there was people that hosted me in their home so I could do my research in San Diego. A friend of mine who's a judge uh, gave me some of the information about the case. Uh, you know, I had a lot of people that really contributed. So uh, I didn't do it all myself. And you, of course, Louise, <laughs> I couldn't have done it without you. So, yeah. Uh, another thing I just want to mention about uh, the, the questions uh, asking how did the illustrations move into the digital realm. With picture books these days, almost every book becomes a digital file at some point because even if we are given the actual physical paintings from an illustrator or, or collages or whatever the medium is they work in, they do get scanned by the printer because all printing now is based on digital files. And so any illustrations uh, for a picture book that end up as digital files while the illustrator may still have the original work. Right. So someone wants to know if your originals are for sale. Oh, <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure. Contact me through my website, christyhale.com. <laughs> uh, so, okay, I think that wraps things up. Uh, Christy, thank you very much for participating in this latest episode of Lee and Lowe's 
Tea Time Talks. And thank you to everyone who is listening now and who may listen later on at their own convenience. Okay, great. Thank Aloha, you. Aloha, everybody. <laughs> Adios.